Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Laura Cohen and I'm the Executive Director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College at the City University of New York in Bayside, Queens. Our mission is to use the lessons of the Holocaust to educate current and future generations about the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and stereotyping. The Kupferberg Holocaust Center in Bayside, New York is situated on the traditional land of the Mantinecock people who continue to live here today. We offer gratitude and respect to all of the indigenous people of Turtle Island, past, present, and future, including the Lenape and Shinnecock peoples. What I just read is a land acknowledgement. This is a statement recognizing that the land we all occupy in the course of our daily lives, including our schools, jobs, parks, and homes, as well as the names of towns and roads, was first inhabited by another group of people who were forcibly expelled and murdered. Today, we identify those crimes for what they are, mass atrocities and genocide. These horrors continue to have devastating political, social, psychological, economic, and environmental impacts upon and within Native American and indigenous communities. Today's event, From Slavery to Revolution, Afro-Cuban Folkloric Drumming of Matanzas, features performances by the Queensborough Community College Percussion Ensemble under, direct, under the direction of Dr. Neeraj Mehta, Associate Professor of Music at QCC. The program will explore the impact that the urban slavery experience and subsequent liberation had on the way this music has been practiced and performed. Today's program is part of the 2021-22 Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center and National Endowment for the Humanities Colloquium entitled Incarceration, Transformation, and Paths to Liberation During the Holocaust and Beyond. It's organized in partnership with the Queensboro Performing Arts Center and is co-sponsored by the Holocaust, Genocide, and Interfaith Education Center at Manhattan College, the Ray Walpaw Institute at Western, Western Washington University, the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights at Rutgers University, and the Department of Music at Queensboro Community College. Please be sure to submit questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And now to kick things off, I'd like to introduce Dr. Myrna Lekic. Dr. Lekic is a faculty fellow for this year's NEH Colloquium and an assistant professor of music at Queensboro Community College. A pianist, she is active as a recitalist and chamber musician, performing a wide range of repertoire that reflects her interest in multicultural and intercultural music, historical performance practice, and contemporary works. Dr. Lekic's recent, recent publications include two critically acclaimed recordings, a debut solo album entitled Masks and Eastern Currents, a disc of contemporary chamber music. In 2018, she was honored with the CUNY Academy Henry Wasser Award for Outstanding Assistant Professors. Dr. Lekic, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Uh, welcome, a warm welcome to everyone who is joining us today for our final program in uh, this year's colloquium. Um, today, we are um, focusing on the Afro-Cuban folkloric traditions of the city of Matanzas. And um, we are joined by Dr. Neeraj Mehta and our Queensboro music students who are members of the percussion ensemble. The city of Matanzas remains an important hub of Afro-Cuban culture, where drumming traditions that arrived with Africans who were forcibly brought to the island in the 19th century are still practiced today. This drumming tradition has survived urban slavery, during which Africans were incarcerated in the lowest flood-prone parts of the bay. It continued to be performed in secret through colonial and pre-revolution history, and only in the last 40 years has this drumming been performed in the open without the persecution of policing and prejudice. Dr. Mehta, who is, directs the percussion ensemble, um, works in the fields of contemporary art, jazz, um, and world percussion music. He has received multiple grants to research the Afro-Cuban folkloric music in Cuba, and is a founding mem member of the ensemble Dunia, a group that explores the intersection between contemporary art music and percussion music traditions from around the world. He frequently gives performances, lectures, and master classes at colleges and universities throughout the country, and has worked with many notable artists from Steve Coleman to Clyde Stubblefield. He's also a leading performer, researcher, and advocate of Danish composer Per Norgaard's music. Welcome, Dr. Mehta. 
Thank you, Dr. Lekic, for the introduction. Um, I'm very, very excited to be here. Um, I will apologize a little bit. Uh, I'm a little bit under the weather, so my voice is a little bit um, stuffy. But if you'll bear with me, I'm excited to share with you uh, this music. Okay, so um, the first thing I'd like to do is actually share a video with you. Um, so let's take a look at that together. So uh, the video that we just watched uh, features my late teacher from Matanzas, uh, Cuba, Daniel Alfonso. Um, he comes from a lineage of Afro-Cuban musicians that participated in a ritual performance and learned from their elders who in some cases came directly from Africa. Uh, the drums that we just watched are called bata. And like many of the drumming traditions that have crossed the Atlantic from West Africa to Cuba, uh, they've been used as expressions of religion, of culture, of transformation, and have survived under the harsh repressions of slavery, colonialism, and policing. I'd like to begin today's presentation uh, with some background information to help us understand the context from which this music we're about to experience comes from. Uh, part of that understanding has to do with the history of the African diaspora in Cuba and the transatlantic slave trade. So before colonization, um, indigenous people, including the Tainos, populated the island. Uh, these people were wiped out through mass murder, disease, and suicide by the hands of Spanish colonists soon after their arrival in 1492. Uh, in the late 1790s and early 19th century, um, it was French refugees fleeing the Haitian Revolution that brought the influx of slaves and cultivation of sugarcane to the island. This soon became the predominant export of Cuba. Um, much more labor intensive than ranching and tobacco cultivation, uh, this resulted in a massive late influx of Africans to the island. Um, bear in mind that while these Africans were arriving in Cuba, uh, the British in the U.S. had already outlawed the slave trade in 1808. Uh, and abolition of slavery in our country here came in 19 1863, while slaves from the African continent were still being brought to Cuba as late as the 1870s. Okay? Um, so slavery did not end until 1886 in Cuba. And so the African populations in Cuba, of course, are diverse, uh, and the majority is, uh, have Bantu or Yoruba roots. The earliest people to come to Cuba from Africa were the Bantu, uh, who came from what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo in that region. Um, other groups like the Ewe and the Fon people came from what is now the country of Benin and Ghana. And the Yoruba people were some of the last to arrive uh, to Cuba from what is now Nigeria. So the Yoruba people brought with them <clears throat> uh, religious practices that form the basis of a religion in Cuba that is sometimes called Santeria. Practitioners refer to themselves as Lukumi. Um, a subgroup of the Yoruba people um, known as the Iesha settled in Matanzas, Cuba as well, uh, where the Iesha religion is still practiced today. Um, the Yoruba diaspora included people brought to Brazil as well. Uh, the Ketu people, who came from what is now the border region of Nigeria and Benin, can be found in the northern city of Salvador, uh, where the religious practices of Ketu Candomblé are still alive and well as, as well. So there are several reasons why the Santeria religion became widespread in Cuba. 
Aside from the fact that the Yoruba were the last to arrive in large numbers, the religion was open to assimilating other practices such as Arara and Iesa, which I mentioned before. Um, other Afro-Cuban religions that are practiced in parallel to Santeria include Palomonte, which is connected to the Congolese people, Ibo, and Catholicism, and finally Abakwa. Um, the Abakwa is actually a secret society formed by Afro-Cuban men as a form of kinship, protection, and hierarchy that subverted colonial power. Um, the practice includes religious belief and religious performance, but is open to any who take the oaths of loyalty and secrecy. So the Yoruba diaspora uh, and culture exists beyond Cuba today, of course, um, and can be found in places like Puerto Rico um, and some of the biggest cities here in the United States and Canada. That includes here in New York City, um, as well as Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco, Toronto, um, to a certain degree in uh, Miami, Florida. Um, and the religion is based on the idea that aspects of life are personified as orishas who are spiritual deities with mythological stories not unlike Greek and Roman mythologies. Um, the Yoruba believe in a supreme deity as well, called Olorun. Um, in Santeria, the Orishas are often aligned with Catholic saints who match similar attributes. So, for example, uh, Babaluaye, who is the Yoru Yoruba deity, is sometimes referred to as San Lazarus, the patron of the sick. Um, sometimes alignments uh, don't match gender. In fact, in the case of Chang'o, who's the deified king in the Yoruba tradition um, and is pictured here on the slide, uh, sometimes associations of lightning uh, are also connected to the saint Santa Barbara. And so you'll see images of Santa Barbara on an altar for Chang'o. So now that I have a little bit of an understanding of the religious background of Afro-Cuban culture, uh, I want to speak to the way the music of this culture survived under the oppression of slavery, colonialism, and policing. In the city of Matanzas, uh, slavery existed in its urban form. And what that means is uh, enslaved people resided together in an area uh, at, of the bay in the lowest to sea level, and this area was prone to flooding. So it was, it was some of the worst areas in Matanzas to live. Barracks housed slaves of multiple owners. So uh, slaves belonging to multiple owners all lived together in this area. Um, these barracks remain homes for many of the Afro-Cubans who are descendants of slaves today. Um, these descendants uh, included important drummers, like my former teacher who we saw in the video earlier, Daniel Alfonso, um, and also uh, Esteban Chacha Vega, who taught my mentor, Michael Sparo, um, and was one of the first Afro-Cubans to teach non-Cubans these drumming traditions. Um, Chacha's room was actually infamous for having uh, one of the last giant eye bolts in the wall used for ch uh, to chain slaves. And he kept that in his wall uh, to signify, as people came to learn these traditions, the struggle in which this, these traditions were able to survive and passed on. Um, uh, while I wasn't able to, uh, to learn from him, I was able to spend some moments in his presence uh, before he passed away. The legacy that Cha Cha and drummers of his generation left uh, were done so from a history of resistance that meant that drumming styles were passed on orally from one generation to the next. Um, often this music was taught and learned in secret so as not to be exposed to slave owners and later police who often raided Santeria and other religious gatherings out of unfounded fears of criminality and superstitions of the religious practices. Um, open practice of these religions was illegal and remained so into the early years of the revolution when Fidel Castro and the socialist movement took power. 
Um, during subsequent years, intricate ordinances were put in place so that any unlicensed ceremonies uh, taking place were subject to police raids and incarceration of those participating. As time went on, the socialist government changed its stance on Afro-Cuban religious culture and practice and embraced a folkloricized version of it. Um, this was accomplished through formations of performance troops sanctioned through the Ministry of Culture. They performed in Cuba for tourists uh, and went on tours abroad. Within these groups, musicians and dancers collaborated from different traditions, often teaching each other uh, the various styles of drumming and dancing. Today, uh, the Afro-Cuban religious cultures have been embraced in more ways as tourist dollars have flowed into the country by those seeking religious experiences. Uh, the government has created a system of peers to authorize musicians to perform and teach this music, um, and it's helped to support the community of musicians and practi practitioners. Hi, so now I would like to share with you three examples of this musical tradition performed by our own Queensborough Percussion Ensemble students. Um, we're going to start with a rezo, which is a slow, unmetered, or free rhythm song. Um, and it's connected to the minority group as the Arara. Uh, and the Arara people are the people that came from the region that is now Benin and uh, Western Ghana. This song is associated with a deity who cares for the sick. Um, in Arara, the name of this deity is Asohano. Uh, in the Santeria Pantheon, he's known as Babaluaye. Um, and in both cases, he's often depicted using the Catholic iconography of San Lazarus. With all the songs that we'll be singing, they represent an aspect of the deity's stories. Uh, while most Cubans do not speak modern Yoruba, they may be able to gather the overall meaning of the songs as they were passed on from generation to generation. These songs are about, uh, specifically for Asohano in this first video, the Odan tree, a fig tree that offers shade to the weary, and a favorite place of respite for Babalue. Uh, the song tells of those who take rest and dance under the shade of this tree, and how Baba Lue is sometimes seen as the walking personification of this tree. So now I invite you to enjoy this rezo called Ero Bamima. Ero Bamima, Ero Bamima, Ero Bamima, Ero Bamima, Ahamana. Oran suro e oka, e e e. Aso da un kwe o da un kwe. Aso da un kwe o da un kwe. O da un foro e e sulo. Mere mara lenu. Awo dono dosu dono kara da un kwe. O da un foro e he sulo, ele, 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 ele. Mere mara lenu. E o bamima, e o bamima, e e. Oh, no. 
so the next performance I'd like to share with you <clears throat> involves a drumming tradition in Matanzas referred to as Bembe Macagua. This tradition is named after the actual drums, which you see pictured here, uh, used during ritual performances. Um, and these drums were made at the Macawa Sugar Factory um, and are, as you can see, shaped as barrels. Um, the master drummer plays various variations over two drums, while the other two drums play supporting parts. Finally, a foundational rhythm is played on a metal hoe blade. Uh, sometimes a shaker or a chekere, which is a gourd with uh, netted beads around the body, uh, accompanies this music as well. Our performance includes songs that are connected to the deity known as Ogun. Um, Ogun is a warrior and is often depicted as carrying a machete or machete. This is important because the machete was the primary tool used for sugar cultivation. So it's very much connected to the struggle of the slaves. Uh, Ogun is often associated with volcanism and the forging of metal. The songs we sing represent a call for Ogun's arrival with palm leaves as his garment. Um, and it's a declaration of him as the blacksmith. And now I invite you to listen to our version of Bembe Makawa for Ogun. I will say, 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 I will say,
So the final piece I'd like to share with you comes from the Iesa tradition. Um, here you see pictured the Iesa drums. Um, this tradition was incorporated into Santeria practice, including the songs and rhythms, onto other drums like Bata drums. Um, but in Matanzas, the Iesa style is still performed at least once a year on these traditional drums. Um, these drums are smaller and often accompanied by two or more different pitched metal sounds, typically played on whole bells, or whole blades. Um, this music is energetic, and the songs are often sung uh, for the deity known as Oshun. Oshun is associated with beauty, rivers, and is often depicted with a golden dress and jewels adorning her as she dances with a mirror to signify her beauty. The, song praise, the songs we sing praise her as the mother of the rivers and the flowing of her waters. And now our version of Yesa Ochun.
So the music that we enjoyed today and uh, that I had the fortune of learning and teaching comes from a very resilient history uh, existing under oppression of slavery, discrimination, criminalization, and commodification. Um, many people risked and gave their lives for this music to exist today. And it is something I stress with our students who engage in it here on campus. The music continues to play an integral part in Afro-Cuban culture within Cuba and the diaspora, and uh, is a music I find have a deep strength and joy. I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, my colleague at uh, the music department, uh, Dr. Mirla Lechich. Also, thank you to Dr. Laura Cohen and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Marissa Hollywood at the KHC for hosting me today. Um, and the opportunity to share this music with you all. Uh, I'd also like to thank my students uh, in the QCC Percussion Ensemble, uh, Kochi, Daniel, Vincent, and Yanni. Um, and they worked really hard to learn this music and make these videos so we could enjoy them together uh, here in this presentation today. Um, also, I wouldn't be able to do this presentation without the support of my wife, Preeti Shah. And uh, finally, thank you all for attending today. Uh, and now I'd be happy to open things up with questions. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. This was enlightening and very interesting. Um, uh, while we wait for some questions which should appear in the chat here, I believe, um, uh -huh. I had a question myself. So it's, it is estimated that uh, probably 1.3 million Africans uh, came to Cuba as enslaved people. Um, and um, I was just wondering, um, you had mentioned the different groups and the traditions that they brought with them. Um, in terms of when and how they were able to practice this music, um, construct instruments, uh, you know, just find ways for it to survive. Can you give us some more information about that? Sure. I, I think, um, you know, I think when we learn about the, 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 the history of slavery in North America, I think we often um, understand it in terms of a couple things. First of all, um, a loss, quite a significant loss of language and culture, um, and also a much more of a rural plantation life. Right. And so those are two important factors that were a little bit different in Cuba. The biggest factor is, in fact, the fact that we get Cuba, Africans from a particular the Yoruba Empire coming very, very late in our in the history. OK, so just like any immigrant experience. Right. Uh, those first people to to go to a different place are still speaking the language, are knowing the traditions very closely. But as generations, subsequent generations pass, some of those uh, elements of the language um, uh, are changed um, or um, are not as directly understood. So, for example, uh, I believe one of the last fluently speaking Yorubans, uh, fluently speaking, uh, Yoruba speaking um, Afro-Cubans passed away um, in the last decade. So... Um, Whereas if you were to try to trace that back in the North American slave experience, we would have to go many more generations further back. So just as a factor of time, because you're getting Cub uh, Africans coming with that knowledge much later in the history, they're bringing those, those traditions to the people who are already there in Cuba and saying, well, this is how we were doing it in Africa. So this is, you know, and then the people that were there in, in Cuba already were then willing to uh, learn and assimilate and work together. And again, that goes to this idea of Santeria as being much more inclusive, this idea that, and if you go to Cuba today in the Matanzas uh, or even Havana, um, you'll find Afro-Cubans that will say, yeah, I, I, go, I practice Santeria, I do Arara, I do Abacua, I do, you know, they, they, they'll list all these religions that they belong to. Um, and and uh, practice. So um, that's not to say that slavery was any less harsh. You know, I think there's this this um, kind of um, idea that um, because there is a presence of more 
African religious uh, uh, performance and practice and um, uh, connections to African religious um, tradition in the Caribbean, in parts of Brazil, that somehow the slavery was less harsh, that people were able or allowed to do or maintain more of their culture. Um, and uh, those elements of their culture were still just as discriminated against, um, was, were uh, seen as potential threats still. Um, and so the way they maintained it was in secret. The way they maintained it was to play on non-traditional instruments. Okay, um, and it wasn't until later on in the history that they began to start to construct drums, carve drums, and start to use these drums in ritual performance. Thank you, thank you. I see that we have some um, questions appearing now. Um, so the first question says, have you or will you be taking your students to Cuba for first-hand experience? <laughs> um, I have not been able to do that, uh, but that would be a wonderful experience. And I think um, you know, it's been, uh, the last time I was in Cuba was in 2013, so quite a bit has changed since then, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, that would be a wonderful opportunity, certainly. Thank you. Question two. I wonder if you know how and if these traditions and music continue with Afro-Cubans as they travel to and live in the U.S. Yeah. Um, so in particular, Santeria certainly exists um, and in a pretty strong way. Um, one kind of unique thing about the Santeria drumming tradition of Bata, the, the drumming that we saw my teacher perform, is that the, um, there, are, there are kind of two types of Bata drums. One type is just drums that are constructed to play. You can learn on them, you can practice, you can do, you can play them in a Latin jazz context, you can play them in an orchestra, and I've seen both. Then you have the other drums, which are the drums we saw in the video, which are consecrated. They've undergone ritual, uh, uh, specific rituals, and in a sense, uh, an orisha, anya, has been put into those drums. Um, and that facilitates, in the ceremonial practice, um, um, allowing for the practitioners to enter a state of trance, and for the... Um, the Orishas to actually embody those practitioners and then counsel the rest of the congregation. And that's sort of how the, the religious practice works. So part of that tradition, after that very first set was made, is that every subsequent set has to undergo a, a ritual in which the original set sort of gives birth to the new set of drums. And so in a way you can follow this almost uh, 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 gene genealogy of sets of drums going all the way back to that first set in Cuba. So you can find sets of drums, trace them back from Puerto Rico, from New York, from LA, from San Francisco, people who have uh, consecrated bata drums and it, either in Cuba and brought them to the United States or brought them to other parts of North America and the Caribbean um, or have birthed them from drums that originated from Cuba. So, um, so there's a direct connection there, absolutely. Um, how much discrimination is there against those that still practice these religions? What is being done to not lose these traditions? Um, it's a very interesting thing, actually. Uh, there's a couple reasons why some of these traditions are either changing or in some cases being forgotten. Um, and not all of it has to do with racism or prejudice. Um, some of it has to do with the political climate itself. Okay. Um, certainly, there is a certain level of discrimination, I think, or at least um, a, a, a prejudice in the sense that you'll find the affinity and the way Cubans talk about Afro-Cuban culture will be different between light-skinned Cubans and dark-skinned Cubans. Okay, and that goes for the religious music and it goes for the secular uh, folkloric music as well. Um, primarily, you'll see Afro-Cubans um, practicing this music performing this music, engaged in it on a professional level, and engaged in it on a religious level. Um, if you were to stop a light-skinned Cuban and ask them about the tradition, they would certainly appreciate it. They would say, yes, it's part of our Cuban, Cuban heritage. And that's a very much a part of the government's initiative to bring Afro-Cuban culture and promote it, um, which is a more recent thing. 
Okay, if you go back, as I said, to the probably the first few decades of the revolution, uh, it was still seen as something um, that was unacceptable. Um, so I think if you go to Cuba today, you'll find that there's a general appreciation and acceptance amongst all Cubans of these traditions and these practices. Uh, some of that is um, coming from more of a sense of 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 national pride um, and if you were to ask them specifically if they believe or if they agree you'll find maybe varying degrees of, of, of opinions there um, in terms of the loss of knowledge a lot of that also has to do with the the political realities and harsh harshness of the life that Cubans have faced especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, okay? So up until the fall of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was essentially buying sugar at this inflated rate and bringing, bringing money and resources into the country. And so most Cubans, whether they were Afro-Cubans or, or uh, of Spanish descent, had a place to live, could afford a, a car, could af afford to go out on the weekends, had a pretty good life. But when the Soviet Union uh, broke apart, the economy really collapsed in Cuba and there were rations and everyone had ration cards and things got much more dire. And I think that's when you started to see, right, we get the Mario boat that came from Cuba in which Fidel Castro put prisoners and also anyone else who wanted to leave the island on a boat and send it to Miami. Um, and you continue to get people who claim political asylum and left. Um, in terms of musicians, um, still to this day, you'll find touring groups from Cuba in which they'll go on tour, and at the end of the tour, some musicians will defect and stay here in the United States. And so with that going on, with younger generations leaving the island, and uh, then the elder still remaining on the island, some of that knowledge is, uh, is not being transmitted simply because the next generation is not there because they've left, okay? Um, and so that's, that's, I think, where the, 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 biggest, um, uh, the biggest issue is in terms of losing some of these traditions. Um, and some of them have been lost. Um, and uh, in the last 10, 15 years, some really important drummers and important musical figures in this culture have passed away and taken some of that knowledge with them. Cha-Cha is one example. He taught a lot of stuff to a lot of people, but there are things that he chose not to teach. And so he took to the grave with him. So. The um, last two questions relate to other genres. So one is um, how this drumming influenced other genres or did it, um, and how it relates to Wagwan Ko. So if you could uh, speak to that a little bit. Sure, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, all of these drumming traditions, in terms of the musical, the musical elements, the foundational rhythms, often the rhythms that you'll hear on the bell, um, those have translated um, in different ways into the popular dance styles. Um, if you heard the Iesa rhythm, some of those bell parts you'll sometimes hear in the festival drumming uh, taking place during Carnaval. So uh, sometimes uh, people will uh, refer to that as Congo, Conga or Conga Oriental or the Comparsas, right? And those and all of those rhythms uh, from those Comparsas and those Congas, like those, you know, you could sort of, if you know of the Samba in Brazil, sort of the, the Cuban version of that, um, those rhythms were directly put into the salsa band. So you'll find those rhythms there. Um, the drums, you know, the drums that we played on in our performance are conga drums. Those are a Cuban drum made out of slats of wood um, in a barrel, you know, style similar to barrels that were used for molasses. Um, and so those drums actually didn't make their way into the popular bands until the 50s, actually. I mean, that's because before that point, they still represented a sense of, of, of Africanness that, you know, other people felt a threat from a little bit. So it took time for those drums to have worked their way into the popular, into popular context. Um, in terms of rumba, 
Um, so rumba is sort of the umbrella term for uh, different styles of this uh, secular uh, folkloric drumming and dancing um, that includes wawanko. And um, again, this drumming and this this uh, these rhythms are directly connected to some of the religious drumming and the religious uh, religious rhythms that uh, we talked about today, um, and most definitely performed by these same musicians. So when I spoke about these uh, folkloricized groups, these professional groups that are or assembled of Afro-Cuban musicians to perform these styles for tourists or go on tour, they were doing not only the religious practices. Typically, if you go to a performance of these, they would start the whole performance with a first half that's all religious. So the dancers will come out wearing the religious clothing, representing the orishas, they'll do the dances, they'll play bata drums, they'll do all that. Then they'll either take an intermission or they'll transition to rumba, which is more like secular, more maybe more festive, a little bit more uh, flirtatious in Spanish as opposed to Yoruba or other uh, African languages. Um, and so there's a direct connection there. And with Walanko and all rumba, it, it really is a music that's of the home. You don't need drums. People will start tapping on furniture or whatever, and it's just whatever moves people to sing about, whether that be religion. If a singer decides to sing some religious songs, they may. Um, and they may sing about their faith. They may sing about their nationality, uh, their identification with Cuba. And these are subject matters that often come about in Wallanco. So it's all interconnected, absolutely. Thank you so much. I believe Yes, I believe we have answered all the questions. Um, one of our viewers is recommending um, Museo de Santeria, a Guan, um, Guanabacoa, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh -huh. um, perhaps yes. you know it and our viewers can um, look it up. So thank you so much, Dr. Meta. It's always a pleasure to work with you. And this was a very meaningful program that fits uh, very well into our colloquium theme for this year. Um, and um, I would like to invite Dr. Cohen if she has any concluding remarks or questions. Thank you both very, very, very much. Uh, I've just been really taken with the conversation and um, part of my family is Cuban. Um, so there's a Cuban Jewish community there and uh, we have a family member who's actually participating in the call. And I guess one of just the questions that I had to close was what got you interested in not only the music, but the history of Cuba and how does that connect to you in your personal life? Um, I actually came, you know, I'd listened to some Latin jazz in high school and enjoyed it. I didn't know much about it. Um, anytime I'd try to play the conga drums, I'd hurt my hands. <laughs> and so, so that was like my introduction. But um, my, I think, was it my sophomore year, my junior year in undergrad, um, the Latin American and Iberian uh, 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 studies program at the University of Wisconsin um, sponsored uh, a Cuban percussionist to come and work with us for a semester and uh, his name was Roberto Vizcaino and he was a Latin jazz musician but also knew all the traditions and everything and that was like that, that was when I really had the uh, a deep opportunity to learn this music um, and then the other person that I, I, I learned quite a bit of music, two other people that were very important for me um, were Americans. Um, one is Michael Spiro, um, who is non-Cuban um, and has dedicated his life to the study and performance of this music, was one of the first um, non-Cubans to, to study with um, all these people in Cuba and um, during a time that was very repressive and and uh, in Cuba in terms of uh, Americans being there and, and things like that. So um, so that was another mentor of mine. And then a third mentor uh, was uh, another musician in the San Francisco Bay Area. Both of them are based in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, John Santos, who's uh, a, a done a lot of work with the Smithsonian now um, about diaspora and Cuban diaspora and Latin jazz um, and continues to perform and uh, continues to do uh, uh, work and research in this area. Um, so yeah, that, those are kind of the, the, the places where I got interested and then as I learned more with the drumming, I performed and gigged in, in different bands and 
and had opportunities to teach this music and then eventually applied for some grants through my graduate school um, and I had an opportunity to go down there and uh, the rest is history, as I say. <laughs> That's really powerful. You know, one of the things at the center that we are always interested in is all these different connections and making the past really relevant. So when you were talking about the revolution, like that's the conversation that also happens with members of my family as well. So it's very, very powerful. So I want to thank you. I want to thank Marina for just the really powerful and um, fantastic program to all the students and to all of the artists that participated today. On behalf of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College, we thank you very much and we hope you all stay safe and well. Thanks, everyone.